You hear an awful lot of people these days talk about the red pill, about the blue pill, about the black pill, as if we've discovered something new about mankind in the last 10 years, as if the internet has gifted us insight into the struggle the genders have in relating to each other that we've never discovered before. But of course, this is not true. The internet is discovering nothing new, nothing that the German incels in the 19th century have not discovered. So what we're going to do today is to dive into the works of a German incel, of a German chud named Arthur Schopenhauer, who had some very strong opinions on the opposite sex, very strong opinions on women and how the genders relate to each other that shows us that people were discussing red pills hundreds of years before we were even a glint in our father's eye. So to set the stage for this, we should take a look at some of Schopenhauer's foundational thinking and foundational principles, because this informs us an awful lot about his perspective on women. He was a philosopher after all, and he saw how the genders manifest in our relationship to reality. Well, it'll all make sense in a moment. Bear with me. You see, Schopenhauer was a yoga bunny. Schopenhauer liked the East and he liked Buddhism, but he was different than those pony-tailed hipsters that you see go out to the East and talk about how they went to Bali and they went to Nepal and they went on a trek and drank some really nice coffee or something like this and they said it was such an, a mind-opening experience where they found themselves. Instead, Schopenhauer actually just read what Buddhism was saying. He actually confronted the religion on its own terms and he discovered a very pessimistic perspective on the world. He discovered that these Buddhists were extremely black-pilled about reality. Most yoga bunnies would present their philosophy of life as live, laugh, love, but Schopenhauer and the Buddha, they were dark yoga bunnies. They had a negative perspective on the world, a pessimistic perspective on the world. And this comes from looking at the way that reality works. I've said all this before, but I will say it again. They look out and they see the circle of life, that thing that people make beautiful songs about in The Lion King. You know, they're like, oh, it's the circle of life. It's so joyful. This is so amazing. Let's participate in this. It sounds so good. It sounds so enticing to come along and participate in the circle of life. But instead, if Schopenhauer was directing The Lion King, what you'd see instead is that, you know, the circle of life involves this poor, innocent, little, feeble child gazelle this little baby gazelle just wandering around and then all these lions just jump out of nowhere and just pull its liver out and eat it while it's still bleeding. And the gazelle is screaming like, ah, I'm in so much pain. I, it even sounds trivial when I say it because it's literally horrific when you watch this stuff. They scream in agony as their, their organs are torn out of their body while they're still alive and their heart is eaten in front of them. It's like a human sacrifice, but it happens every single day. Schopenhauer, the dark yoga bunnies would see this stuff and they'd be like, that's what life actually is on its fundamental level. And that's savage and that's brutal. That is a bad deal. The pleasure that the lions are getting is okay, but it's not that much. Compared to the agony that the gazelle is going through, that's e exorbitant, it's huge. There's so much pain involved in this little exchange. Overall, it just doesn't weigh up. Life has to be a negative experience. Overall, there's too much suffering and not enough pleasure. And this is where we get to the question of women. Because you see, us men, us dudes, us blokes, we're rational, aren't we? We can sit around and we can observe the world. We can look out our window and we can analyze this jungle. We can watch this scene happen. We can pull up nature is metal on Instagram and can, we can watch these gazelles get murdered ruthlessly. And we can use logical deductions to figure out that, oh my God, the world is evil. We're able to figure that out. We're able to suppress all of these natural instincts inside of us, wanting us to participate in this, you know, hunger that's telling us, go, go eat, go eat the gazelle, go participate, go murder the gazelle, go murder the cow, all that burger you have, kill the cow and just eat the burger. We can suppress all that stuff with the power of our prefrontal cortex, of our rational mind. We can crush that out of ourselves and take responsibility and observe rationally what's going on. And we can realize the true nature of the world and we can wake up from this. We can become enlightened. We can see that the world is a demonic experience of pain and suffering. And that is great for us until a good looking woman shows up. And when a good looking woman shows up, we feel an urge inside of us that is stronger than hunger, that is stronger than anything. We feel our libido switch on and we get aroused. And all of a sudden we're hot and heavy and we're nervous and our rational mind is just all flustered, blathering and all this type of stuff. And we can't meditate anymore. And we turn into a simp and we want to be with that girl. We see that girl and we're like, God damn it. I've been a German incel for so long. I must overcome this. I must be with that girl. She is so beautiful. And something inside 
inside of us, our instincts overcome, our primal instincts overcome our rational mind, cook it, shove it out of the way, and we lose a sense of ourselves and we become like a rowdy stag, a rowdy deer or something like this, and we chase after that girl. We start to think with our dick, as we say, and we cannot control ourselves. And something very fascinating is happening in this moment. In this moment, when our libido is switched on, woman is seducing us to participate in life. Woman is breaking our rationale and snapping us out of reality. The woman is drawing us back into the samsara of life. We are getting seduced into forgetting, into losing ourselves and getting intoxicated with life once again. And nature does this, samsara does this, by filling us with all these strong feelings and dangling a carrot in front of us, dangling this feeling of like, you'll get to orgasm, you get to blow your load inside of that girl. You'll get to touch her old, her ghibli boobies. You'll get to go grab her, her ghibli hips and all this. It's going to be so goddamn nice. Oh my God, you're going to love that stuff. And this carrot is dangled in front of you and you get all fired up about it and you're like hot and heavy and there's dribble coming out your mouth and you're saying, God damn it. Fuck reason. Fuck Buddhism. You flip over. You pull off your orange robes. You say, enough of this crap. Enough of this bullshit. I'm going to go. I'm going to do it. And you surrender. You surrender to the feeling. You get intoxicated with the moment. You go Amor Fati, Dionysian Nietzsche mode. And you no longer see or care about the real world. You no longer care if the real world involves murdering gazelles and pulling out their hearts and killing them. You don't give a fuck about any of that stuff. You just want to get your nut off. So for this reason, the Buddhists say that the trick, the demiurg, the veil, the witch that plays a spell upon your mind and puts this curtain over your face so you cannot see the horrific nature of reality where the gazelle is getting murdered, that is called Maya, which is where we actually get the Indo-European, the Aryan word for matter for material reality itself, where we also get the word for mother. All of these are, are related. Maya is the feminine, is the woman. She is a seducer. She is a witch. She shows off her beautiful body, her curves, her big luscious lips, and she seduces you to want her, and you forget yourself. And by that trick, she gets you to play and participate in samsara. And you were tricked into going and fighting other men. So you participate in the conflict and the, the desire of suffering. You go and beat up other dudes and you kill them and you cause suffering for them. And you, of course, you have to go and kill gazelles so you can eat, so you're strong, so you can beat these guys up. All because you want to blow your knot at the end of it. All because you want to get that in the end. And this is what Buddha would say is that suffering is a consequence of desire. And desire is a consequence of our attachment to this spinstress, the cycle of samsara, the magic trick that the mother goddess Maya is playing in all of us. We are seduced into participating in nature, which is evil, by the seductions of the feminine. So this is obviously some of the most high class, sophisticated misogyny you're ever going to come across. Women are the spiritual force of seduction that gets you to engage with the evil of the world. But this is what these guys are saying. This is what this entire religion is all about. This is what this German chud, Schopenhauer, is banging on about. Now this twisted and hardcore view of nature's plans for us is the core to understanding Schopenhauer and I guess his interpretation of Buddhism. The whole of your life is a trick. There is some seducing witch called nature that is playing a trick on all of us, getting us to participate into a bummed deal, into a horrific meat mince grinder of pain and suffering that has no purpose. And the whole goal of this trick, the entire way your life is structured, is that nature wants you to create more children so that she can sacrifice them to samsara and torture them. Nature needs more little baby gazelles that she can feed to the lions and more little baby lions that she can make murder each other so that the best one can eat the gazelles. Nature, this little cackling witch, has got some seriously dark plans for us and she cares nothing about our individual pain or our individual suffering or our lives at all. We are completely irrelevant to her project and her plan. We are merely puppets, pawns in her game. This is quite crazy stuff when you think about it. And so our whole experience of these grand feelings of love, of romance, these things that we talk about, of marriage, of relationships, the way that people try to get purpose out of them. People sort of say to themselves, you know, I want to get married because I want to have a purpose. I want to have a family. I want to have all these types of things. Now, 
Caveat, of course, I'm a Nietzschean, and Nietzsche was responding to an awful lot of these very dark thoughts with an opposing, polarizing view that was pro-life and with life and affirming of life that was actually affirming nature. That was Nietzsche's answer to this. But Nietzsche was this ardent student of Schopenhauer because you can't properly fight as a Jedi for the light unless you've embraced the darkness, unless you've actually seen what is the dark side. And Schopenhauer, and I guess you could say the Buddhists a little bit, are this representation of the dark side. And so the reason why I said that caveat is because Nietzsche, not Nietzsche, Schopenhauer, is pointing to all these treasured feelings that we have of love, of romance, of creating stable relationships, of creating children, of participating in these goals, these purposeful goals that we all have. These goals where we say, well, we must have kids because kids are the most important thing in the world. You hear people say this stuff all the time. Oh, my kids give my life meaning. Well, of course they do. That's what nature wants. Nature wants you to feel like this life has meaning, but it does not. This life is evil. This life does not have any meaning other than you creating more either demons or victims to participate in the meat grinder. And all the love that you felt when you were younger, that attraction you felt for someone, that you gave so much meaning, that led you to create children, had no meaning either. It had no purpose. It had nothing going for it at all. In fact, it was a trick played upon on you by nature to keep the meat grinder going. This schizophrenic, irrational meat grinder that the Buddha said, why don't we just fucking detach from this shit? I'm not not playing in this game anymore. Buddha's just sitting there meditating and he's like, wait a second, this is all fucking stupid. Like I'm 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 not playing in this game anymore. You haven't realized that yet. You haven't become rational and objective. You haven't segregated yourself from the terrible suffering of the world. And for this reason, you cannot see the meat grinder for what it is. So you're seduced into participating in it. You meet somebody else, they're beautiful, of course, they're only beautiful because they're young, and they're only beautiful because they're signaling to you that certain faculties they have would lead to good breeding. They've got big boobs, or they've got a high testosterone, so they've got a good square jaw, they've got big strong muscles. They look beautiful because they're signaling to you that they're healthy and natural and strong in the natural world. If they're full of testosterone, it means that they can murder lots of gazelles for you. If you've got big boobs, that means you can give your child loads of milk and fill your child, make its brain go big so it can kill lots of more gazelles. But none of this stuff has got any type of objective, platonic idea of beauty at all. It's not like an art painting or something like this. None of this stuff is is like this. This is just you being attracted to, you know, big mammary glands, these big, you know, j- jiggling organs off people's bodies, these like weird things that don't make any sense. You're attracted to an allusion to a dream. And so these big jiggling tits or these big strong biceps, these seduce you into participating in nature's plan. And you rationalize, you make up stories to yourself that this has some type of meaning. Or you say, oh, I found the one. I found my life partner. I'm in love. You create, you, you feel this rush of oxytocin that is getting you to participate in this ritual that's going to create children. And you say crazy stuff to yourself, like this is the one, this is who I care about, this is right, this is the one for me. You make up, you make up some type of profound destiny that is not true at all. That is complete nonsense, and it's not there, it's not real. All because nature wants you to. Nature's flooding you with oxytocin. You have sex with somebody, nature's gonna fill you full of all these chemicals to make you bond with them. There's nothing magical happening here. There's no destiny, there's no plan, there's no God ordering your relationship, there's no purpose. This is just you feeling nature seducing you because nature has a goal that's beyond you. Nature wants those children that she can sacrifice to the meat grinder. And when she gets them, she doesn't give a fuck about you at all. You are a slave to her goals. And this is what you see happening in these relationships. And Schopenhauer has a quote here. This is Schopenhauer now. With girls, nature has had in view what is called, in a dramatic sense, a striking effect. For she endows them for a few years with a richness of beauty and a fullness of charm at the expense of the rest of her life. So that they may during these years ensnare the fantasy of a man to such a degree as to make him rush into taking the honorable care of them in some kind of form for a lifetime. A step which would not even seem sufficiently justified if he only considered the reality of what was happening. 
Accordingly, nature has furnished woman, has created woman, as she has created the rest of her creatures with the weapons and implements necessary for the protection of her existence and for just the length of time that they will be of service to her so that nature has proceeded here with her usual economy just as the female ant after sex loses her wings after the female ant gets pregnant she loses her wings which have at that point become useless she no longer needs to fly she's not the queen they might even be in the way they're a waste of energy for breeding purposes so she she drops them you see the exact same thing in a woman a woman is beautiful this is her wings this is her tool that she needs in order to ensnare a man seduce a man towards this project of life and when she's given birth to one or two or three children her beauty fades her beauty drops these implements that nature uses are cast off and she turns into a blob and probably for the same reasons as Schopenhauer says. Whoa, okay, that goes hard. And this shows you that Schopenhauer is not just giving women a bash for no reason. He's sort of pointing out that nature exploits women just as much as men. Man's problem is he gets seduced by fantasies. He looks at this woman and her beauty charms him. And because of this charm, he says to himself, right, well, I'll marry this girl and I'll keep her for life. His original decision was based on the fact that she was beautiful. But then, of course, she ensnares him. She gives him her body in the prime of her youth. And then they have a couple of kids. And then she starts to get chubby. And she starts to lose all that shape. And her, her boobs sag. And she starts to become disgusting and decrepit. Because she's morphing into a mother. She's morphing into somebody who can, you know, handle the kids and take care of the kids. She's changing into something else. Something that is functional for the preservations of life because her beauty doesn't matter her ego doesn't matter the man's desires for a beautiful wife for the end of time does not matter none of this stuff matters none of this stuff is important to nature nature's goal is not the individual satisfaction of the individual of the ego none of that stuff matters to her nature just wants children human sacrifices that she can shove into the meat grinder that's all she cares about and so what nature does is she gives the woman beauty for a time that it is useful and then she takes it away from her the second that she's become pregnant the second she has a couple of babies boom beauty no longer needed project sorted out just make sure that these kids grow up nice and full of flubber and fat so we can feed them feed them to some demon or make them big and strong so they can be the demon i want to crush the world and cause more suffering <laughs> says nature now schopenhauer goes even further here to come up with possibly the most incel take I've ever come across in my life. Like, this takes the biscuit. This is gold medal incel take. This is some hardcore stuff. He goes so far as to say that women aren't the beautiful sex. They're not even that good looking at all, you know? It's all a delusion. And he points it out in a very interesting way. I'll read you the quote here. It is only the man whose intellect is clouded by his sexual instinct that could give that stunted, narrow-shouldered, broad-hipped and short-legged race the name of the beautiful sex. For the entire beauty of the sex is based on this instinct. One would be more justified in calling them the unaesthetic sex rather than the beautiful one. Neither for music nor for poetry nor for fine arts have they any real or true sense and susceptibility. And it is a mere mockery on their part in their desire to please if they affect any such thing. There's some hardcore sentences, but what is this German chud saying? Well, all of woman's beauty is built on sexual signaling. It's almost like a functional attraction. And so man, man being so prone to not being able to control his intellect and stay rational and instead getting seduced by his urges and his instincts, he can't look at a woman and stay objective. It really tells you an awful lot about your life, that he can't look at a woman and not get his emotions involved. He can't look at a woman and not feel his instincts. So when he's in the presence of a woman and he sees big jubbly, jubbly boobs, as I said earlier, he gets, he gets deluded. 
His intellect gets clouded by passions, by these, you know, bursts of dopamine and bursts of testosterone and urges. And he can't see objectively what she is. Now, if you go into the arts, you'll notice that if you look at those old paintings of women, the women don't look that sexy. They don't look like Instagram models. They don't look that amazing. When women are painted into these like Renaissance photos, or if you look at the ancient Greeks and all this, it's actually male bodies that tend to be celebrated, almost like they're bodybuilders. It's, it's a very interesting phenomenon. You know, maybe, I don't know, maybe all of European history is gay. That's like, that's one way you could call it. Maybe we're just going to have to accept that fact or something like this. But it seems perhaps that when you're able to get that artistic distance, because art is not really something designed to, you know, switch, it's not porn, you know, it's not designed to get you roused up and rowdy. Art is doing something slightly different. It's trying to show you sort of perfection and platonic forms and, you know, the sort of objective beauty of the world and, you know, how as God is manifest, you know, the beauty of music inside reality, art is trying to show you this stuff. And so when it comes down to form and sharpness and and and, and elegance and, and these types Types of things in order when that's present it seems like the male body is actually the aesthetic one the male body is the one that gets all these defined muscles and these defined shapes whereas women has got more of a functional body she's got this big kind of blubbery wide hips she carries a lot of fat on her hips you know women tend to have higher body fat on average it's healthier for women to have higher body fat because woman is ultimately uh, a sort of breeding horse <laughs> if we to put it this way she's built nature has built her for a purpose and that purpose is not beauty whereas man has been built for something much different. Man, in some sense, has been more built for beauty than woman. And this makes man more beautiful. Man is more of a unique animal than woman when you think about it. And this sounds pretty extreme. You know, the German chud, you're like, Steph, what are we, what are we even talking about here? But if you go and look at other animals, if you're able to take your desire, you know, for looking at a girl and being like, God damn, she's a smoke show. It, it just doesn't make sense to you to hear this. You know, your intellect is crowded by Maya. That's why. Or clouded by Maya. But if you go and look at other animals, like you're not sexually aroused to peacocks, I hope. You're not really that into, you know, um, pigeons, I hope. If you go look, or, or lions, for example, I hope you don't want to go and, uh, you know, swipe on lion bumble or lion tinder or something like this. You go look at these other animals and you'll always see that the way that we represent those animals to humanity, the beautiful specimens of the other animals, we don't show the females because the females are all ugly and boring and demure. If you look at the peacocks, the beautiful, big tailed peacocks are male. The women tend to be look like little chickens, you know, they're little small, they're not that interesting because they're not built for that. The male are all about, you know, signaling these big, beautiful things and fighting each other and all this type of stuff. So the, the peacocks, the males are actually the aesthetic one in the peacocks. You look at the lion. The, the women lion, they look like they're all bald cells. They don't have their big manes. Whereas the male lions are big, strong, and they have their big, powerful ma manes. And we think of a lion, we think of a big maned lion being a badass. The same with many other animals. You can go through a lot of different instances of this and you start to see, you say, wait, wait a second. In the animal kingdom, there seems to be this trend. There's this pattern where the males are the, the beautiful, the males are the aesthetic, the males are the, the high grade, the chisels, the, the, the excellence, the, the ones worth celebrating. And the women aren't. And it, it can happen out in nature. Is it, does it possibly happen in our species? Are you a speciesist? Are you not able to sit down and look objectively at your own species? Are you not able to see that? We say to ourselves, it seems like our entire culture is about celebrating the beauty of women. And of course, I believe, I'm a Nietzschean, I believe a firm life. Women are, are, are hotties, I absolutely love them. But Schopenhauer, the German should, he's pointing out, it's like, well, what if that's not the case? What if women are goddamn unesthetic cretins? You know, they're short. They've got these little small legs. They're all big and you know, bandy and covered in flab and fat. They're, they're breeding stock. You know, that's, that's what they're built for. That's what nature makes them to. Men, men are made to be bodybuilders. Men are made to be hard and sharp and chiseled. Men are what is beautiful. Men is the aesthetic sex. All right, Schopenhauer. All right, Arthur. So this is supposed to tell us something about ourselves, us blokes. Schopenhauer is trying to point out that Maya seduces us into finding these stumpy little narrow-shouldered cretins, these breeding stocks. We find them beautiful and we have this problem where this fantasy, these urges, these chemicals that flush through our bodies 
pedestalize these women. And that sounds quite extreme, but go onto the internet. Go and look up simp culture. Go and look up OnlyFans. Go and look up Instagram. Go and look up porn. And what do you see? You see all these men who don't have control of their minds. They don't have control of their intellect. They can't remain stoic. Um, bud, bud cells, Buddhist cells. They can't remain stoic, separated, detached, detached supermen who have relinquished the forces of samsara clawing at them. They, they, can't, they can't remain separate from this stuff. And so what do they do all day? They spend all day with these fantasies of women inside of their heads. And they spend all day just giving them all their money and this complete irrational behavior. They're like, oh yeah, just take my money. Squish me, mommy. I just, I just don't want to, I don't want to, uh, I just want to give my money away. I want to be punished. I want to, I want to, I'd love you. Have fallen in love with you. You see all these men who have developed this 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 adoration for the fantasy inside of their head. I remember Tristan Tate, I think, was saying this. Of course, he ran his webcam business and he had the the OnlyFans girls, and he was describing how he would n notice these things where. For example, he would have these demure girls that weren't, you know, they weren't super sexy, big, you know, fake boobs and big lips and, you know, platinum blondes. Instead, it was this sort of more brunette haired girl, slightly maybe paler. She's more like librarian or bookish or kind of a quiet, shy girl. And she would make way more money. She'd have a way bigger army of simps following her. And why would this be? What is happening here? Because, of course, what gets these, what motivates these guys to attach to these girls is the fantasies inside of their heads. And the fantasy they have, their urges, the emotions inside of their heads, is nature is torturing them. Nature wants them to breed with a woman. Nature wants them to stick their dick in a girl and create children. And the way she does this is she tortures both sexes, both genders. She makes the man feel lonely. She makes the man feel sexual urges. All these urges that she plugs inside of him, she makes the man feel inferior status. So he has to try to change this. He has to get his nut off somehow. And so nature's filling him with all of these urges inside of himself and he feels lonely and he feels desire and he feels sexual urges and he feels like he wants a girlfriend and all nature's torture maya this causes this this fantasy to show up inside of his mind and he starts to imagine this shy beautiful becky he starts to imagine this and this fantasy is a complete schizophrenic delusion created by nature to get him to participate in samsara and of course he can't fulfill this fantasy in life because he has no skills he's no game skills he's not, he doesn't know how to go out and pick up girls. He's not, he's not, maybe he's not looks maxed enough, so he's not good enough. He's not good looking enough or something like this. Or maybe he's not brave enough. He's too afraid to go and participate in the project of life and overcome the fear of going to talk to girls. And so for these reasons, he's, he's having these problems with this. And so this fantasy still exists inside of him. He has no control over his mind. And so he goes onto the internet and the girl shows up that fits his delusion, fits his fantasy, fits his idea. And so he starts to simp for her and he is tricked. Now, this is a very weird one because... Nature, in some sense, is is completely irrational. So sh even nature herself doesn't realize that this guy's just like pulling himself into a, a tissue paper while talking to a woman on on OnlyFans. But all of the all of the, the the signals, all of the chemical pathways are hit correctly. So he continues to do this behavior, even though it's a completely parasocial fake relationship with no actual fertility and no actual life happening. It hits all the chemical pathways that are necessary, and so the fantasy is fulfilled, and so everything works. And this is how you see this simp behavior play out. Millions of women across the world making millions of dollars exploiting men like this because there's a lot of lonely men out there who are not Buddhist cells, who are not German incel chud enough to understand that their intellect is getting dominated and clouded by their urges, by their fantasies. They don't realize what they are. They don't realize the trick that nature plays upon them and they create these romantic stories and they feel these huge emotions of loneliness and they think that they have meaning. They think they have to express them somehow. They don't know how to deal with these things because these emotions are so strong. They can't figure out how they're supposed to make sense of them. And so, of course, they get caught in a spider web. They get caught in some type of weird, twisted behavior that is completely built upon nature's programming, attempting to get us to engage in samsara. This is how savage nature is. And it gets an awful lot worse. Schopenhauer gives men a good bashing in this, uh, this essay on women because he is pointing out in this comparison of the sexes, you look at the opposite sex and you begin to reflect on your own sex. And this, Schopenhauer is a general pessimist, so pretty much everything he sees is bad. Women are these narrow shoulders, stumpy spiders that are trying to ensnare us into the project of life, even though it's completely irrational and evil. But of course, men have a very serious problem with fantasy 
with romance. As we just said, they can lead them into these death spirals of things like OnlyFans. But it goes even further than that. The whole concept of love itself, of romance itself, it's built upon these male fantasies. And these are completely made up and untrue. I see actually quite a lot of, I think this is a motif that is said in the red pill space, is that men are the true romantics. Women don't believe in true love. Women will say that, you know, they'll marry you, you'll put on the ring, they'll be like, oh, I'm going to love you forever. They'll take the vows. And then 20 years down the line, they'll cheat on you because they got bored and the love died and they didn't feel respected. And men have this emotion inside of them. And, and like, this is true. I, I've noticed this in guys where men were, were would, would look at something like loyalty through thick and thin. They have, the men have a much more dutiful attitude towards love. They have this idea in their head about this romantic love that even when we get old and saggy and disgusting, we're, we're gonna keep on going forward. Men have that idea inside of their heads. Women don't. Women might say that, but women's practicality will come out. When the man gets pathetic or he becomes a loser, women's practicality is going to surface a little bit and the man is gonna be at serious risk of getting divorced and these types of things. This is just a, a blunt reality of life and that this is the kind of character traits that are different. And so the red pill guys would always say, like, this is why you've got to watch out for getting married and watch out about getting divorced and stuff like this, because women will, will say something on the wedding day. But when she's in her 40s and you've become, you've, your testosterone has dropped and you've got man boobs and you've become a fucking loser or you've lost your job or something like this, she will cheat on you. You know, it's, it will happen and you will get divorce raped. She'll take the kids and then she'll force you to pay for everything. And you right now are getting into this relationship because you have this fantasy inside of your head of the idea of this perfect romantic love where it's you and her till the end of time and all these things. So that's a uniquely male fantasy. Women don't experience that. Women don't have that same feeling. Theirs are much more temporary and they're, they're much more reactive to the practicalities of the world around them. It's a very interesting point you hear from these, these Red Bull guys because you see this stuff. I see it in dudes all the time getting seduced in these relationships and then ending up screwed when you know they think the true love allows them to let their standards slack and then the girl is not actually in it, these type of things. Now, Schopenhauer, <laughs> 150 years earlier, puts a big caveat on this because he's not saying that men are the true romantics. He's pointing out that men have a much bigger capacity for delusion. Men are much better at deluding themselves because nature wants men to delude themselves. Nature wants men to get caught up in these enchantments because nature does not care about your happiness. She doesn't care about your marriage. She doesn't care about your happily ever after. Nature doesn't give a fuck about any of that stuff. None of that is real. None of that is in any way relevant to nature's goals. Nature just wants you to have an orgasm inside of a woman so nature can get a child. So nature can put that woman through the agony of childbirth so she has another gazelle that she can feed to the lions. That's all that nature cares about. And you're happily ever after and your retirement plan, traveling around Italy together, together and you having a happy family. That stuff is not a guarantee. That nature doesn't really care about that so, so too much. Maybe insofar as she might want to keep you together for 20 years while you raise the kids, perhaps. But beyond that, nothing's, nothing's solid, nothing's a guarantee, nothing has to work this way. Once you get that girl pregnant, nature's pretty much done with you. And nature will do everything in her power to make you do this. She will fill you with such intense emotions that you will go on OnlyFans and pay a woman you don't know so you can masturbate to her talking to her when it's probably some person from the Philippines writing down the phone or now it's chat GBD, GB fucking T. That's the situation there. And this propensity for delusion inside of man, this is such a big problem. Men are the ones that are deluded. Men are the ones that have the capacity for reason and objectivity, but men are also the ones who get tricked. Men are the ones who have the romantic stuff pulled over their eyes. Men are the ones that Maya conducts her witchcraft upon. But the goal, even of sex, even of love, even of romance, is nothing to do with the fantasies of men. The fantasy is a tool that nature uses to get her to get these gazelles. But, you know, nature has no qualms about seducing a woman into cheating on her husband. Nature has no cares about this stuff because as Schopenhauer says here, Nature has made it the calling of the young, strong, and handsome men to look after the propagation of the human race so that the species may not degenerate. This is the firm will of nature, and it finds its expression in the passions of women. This law surpasses 
all others in both age and power. Woe then to the man who sets up rights and interests in such a way as to make them stand in the way of life. For whatever he may do or say, they will, at the first significant onset, be unmercifully annihilated. For the secret, unformulated, nay unconscious, but innate moral of woman is, we are justified in deceiving those who, because they care little for us, that is to say, for the individual, imagine that they have obtained the rights over the species. The constitution, and consequently the welfare of the species, have been put into our hands and entrusted to our care through the medium of the next generation which proceeds from us. Let us fulfill our duties conscientiously. Now there's a lot being said here, but the core of it is that there's an unconscious force inside of woman that gives her an entitlement to a profound destiny because her job is to forward the health of the entire species. She is in charge of making sure that the next generation of the race is as handsome and powerful as possible. And this means that she is beyond good and evil in her soul. Her primal instincts are beyond good and evil. They do not give a flying fuck about anything you put in the way of them. They just want to bang the handsomest, most chad, most juicy, biggest brained alpha male possible because that's how we create powerful and healthy children and that's nature's goal. That's what nature wants. She wants lions and she wants gazelles and she will do whatever she can to make sure that she's getting health and strength and power because that's what she is concerned with. And so if you go as a man full of all these delusions that you will put together institutions like marriage or you'll put together some type of uh, equal rights, you'll say this stuff or we'll create up these rational equal relationships. And this is what you see with the whole modern setup of relationships that have basically shown up since Schopenhauer's day. This idea of these sort of contract based relationships where women and men shake hands and they say we'll share gender roles and we'll kind of neutralize ourselves and whatnot and we'll be loyal and honest with each other. You set up anything at all, anything at all that's trying to mitigate this fundamental core reality and you're making a mistake. It's a delusion of man to think of this and it's a mistake of man to listen to a woman demand these things in order to understand what this actual instinct is. Because the urge inside a woman in the most fundamental way is she wants to get dicked down by the biggest, handsomest, youngest Chad she can find. She wants to find the college age football stud. She wants to find Chad and she wants to get ravished by him so that she can have his beautiful, powerful seed and make juicy boils for the next generation. And she will have no qualms about doing that, about receiving that love off that man and marrying another man and having that other man raise those kids. And you can find lots of stories. Go up onto Reddit or wherever you want to go or Twitter or whatever and look for these stories. Look for these people giving out about this stuff. These people who are into things like the red pill and whatnot. And you'll see them talk about this over and over, you know. The the rise of genetic tests in the last 10 years have really started to reveal a lot of these stories where there was one um, story I heard about a man who, who shot himself. It was actually a girl telling the story. And she was saying that she had this perfect family and her dad and her mom got on really well and she loved their dad and she cared about him so much and it was brilliant and dad was really happy and then one day um, they they decided oh like you know the dad was like 50 the girl was like 20 or something like that so they're like oh let's get an ancestry test and, and check out where we're from and stuff like this and see who we have in the past and they took the ancestry test and the, the, the daughter was like and looked at the dad's one her daughter realized that the dad and her have different genetics they have different ancestry and that really confused. They weren't related, you know. That really confused her. That really kind of like made her ponder. It's like, oh, well, there must be something wrong. So she called up, you know, the the ancestry company, and they were like, you know, this has gone wrong. Can we do the test again? It's like, yeah, sure, send it all in. So they send it again, and the same results come back. And then they start to do all the other kids, and you know, all the other kids come up as different genetics than the father. And suddenly the father's like, whoa, what the hell is this? And they, they say it to the wife. And she's like, this is so weird. What's going on here? Completely naive. And the wife just freezes. The wife just goes, you know, blank. And then they're all sort of creeped out. They're like, why is the wife acting like this? And then the wife starts to cry and she starts to explain and she starts to tell the story about the guy next door. And then all of a sudden it dawns on the father, it dawns on the family that all of the kids were sired by the man next door, by actually the friend of the father, apparently, who lived next door for a while. And this hits them like a truck. And then we start to realize that this whole fantasy, this whole 
uh, th- this whole thing that was set up was complete delusion. It was complete, like he lived an entire life. This is how savage nature is. And so he went off and he drove off into a shed. Nobody could find him for, for, for a couple of days. And then um, his father drove out to the shed or something like this, or his, his uncle or his, his cousin or something like that. And they found him on a seat, shotgun, bl- blew his brains out, obviously. So that's how hard it was that whole fantasy that man had inside of his head about his family his beautiful wife his be- his beautiful kids that fantasy created inside of his mind to get him to participate in life nature gives zero fucks nature is savage beyond belief a nature operating true woman would do something like that to him and the whole drama of love the whole drama of romance can be as real as it ever is. It can feel that real. But this is what it can be underneath the surface. These secret truths of life. This is the red pill, you know, this is the black pill. This is the revelation. This is when you pull Maya apart and this is what you see is that it can, it can be that much of a lie. You can spend your entire life feeding these children, believing that your own, building this house, being with this woman, and she could have carried other men's children completely without you knowing because you were caught up in your delusion and unaware of what was going on. And she did that probably because that other man on some level seemed stronger, seemed more attractive and seemed more handsome. She wanted to breed with him. There was something inside of her that felt those deep urges that she needed it off him. And she stuck with the other guy for whatever reason, maybe the convenience of the romance. And who knows, she's not she's not mani- like planning this stuff out in some type of conscious way. She's not like putting her hands together and saying, this is my evil plan or something like this her instincts are sort of carrying her along because nature is using her like a puppet string as well both of them are getting strung along and this is the savageness at the end of it he ends up killing himself in probably the greatest depression you could ever imagine imagine the bleakness of that man's experience sitting in that shack before he puts the shotgun to his face and exits samsara only to be reborn again in some other part of the world imagine the depths of despair he felt they're not the once the romantic delusion is popped and you realize that many of the stories end like this it's not Hollywood it's not a happy ending all the time many people's realities end up like this it really makes you ask a couple of questions it really makes you say to yourself well you know these uh, black pilled Buddhists are kind of onto something now there's an awful lot more in this essay but I won't have time to go into it all it's just so monumental some of the ideas But this idea of delusion and romance, I think, is such a powerful one because it directly comes into this idea of the red pill. You see this sort of red pill space and red pill meme show up, and I've I've seen it around for years. And what I find so fascinating about it is that it's directly dealing with that question. Like, where does that terminology red pill come from? It's waking up from the matrix, isn't it? You take the red pill, Neo, or you take the blue pill. And the blue pill is about you surrendering to the delusion. And what do these people mean? Well, it's that you're a young boy and culture is designed by nature. This is a scary thought, you know, but culture, nature, Maya, Maya is also the word for the matrix, by the way, (laughs) we're starting to get into scary territory now. Matter, matrix, Maya, mother, it's all the same, bro. The materialistic, or or this, we're getting too esoteric here, man. People, people are going to start splitting open the astral planes if I keep going any further into that stuff. But the matrix created by Maya, created by the mother goddess, by the witch, culture exists within this. And so when you're you're a young boy, you were born into the matrix and the matrix is installed inside of you via the power of story. It is installed inside of you via these stories that match your fantasies. You as a young boy, you have, you're going to get these romantic urges when you're about 16 or maybe younger, 12 for some people. And these urges, they're going to be presented to you in some type of cultural garb to get you to, you know, get married and have the girl and propagate. And this is going to seduce you into participating in the goals of life because nature creates culture. All of our instincts are the emotional foundation, the energetic charge that attaches stories to them and gives the stories power. That's why people pay attention to them. This is why, you know, romance novels and songs are always about love. There's a reason why that happens because nature is achieving her goal through art. Art itself is that same delusion to keep you participating in the world. This is why we all dance to these musics and stuff like this when we're out in the club when we're all getting rowdy because it's all a part of the big the big game the big game to trick you into being with somebody with this delusion inside of your head so that you create 
life so you, that you create more gazelles for samsara and this whole story this is what the red pill people get onto is that when you're quote unquote blue pilled when you're unaware when you're in the matrix and you are given these narratives about love you're given these narratives about the nature of the world you're given these narratives about how your life path should work you're told stuff like women are these pedestalized angels and you're going to meet this perfect angel and you should be with her and all these types of things or you're given a story about how women work and it's always incorrect it's always it's always too rosy and too shiny it's always about presenting to you something that is special and pedestalized because you as a young man need to get seduced into seeing past what a woman is so that you breed with her so that you create a, a child or, e or even not create the child but at the very least just you know pay the woman so that she can raise maybe some other dude's child or something like this the nature needs you to bind in these relationships with women and these fantasies delude you and get you to have crazy standards and a, a complete a detachment from the nature of the world and the red pill is about you being able to break free from the matrix now you take the red pill and all of a sudden you can see the matrix you can see you can see maya you can see the trick that maya was trying to play on you and you can start to connect a little bit more with this objective mind of yours and you can start to look and you can start to say to yourself holy lord jesus what is, what are we seeing here all of a sudden you see behind this you start to you know you start to stop seeing a giant pair of boobs walking around and all of a sudden you see a woman who is a period you see a woman who farts you see a woman who poops you know that phrase women don't go to the bathroom women don't poop it's the same male fantasy we don't want to believe that they've got a dirty side but they're animals like us they have hairy legs they have these types of things with them they're a botched decrepit disgusting creature in many ways as well they have even more than this this savage nature inside of them once you start to understand that women's instincts are naturally savage just like ours we as men we have nature inside of us that is incredibly horrible in its own way we do have this rational instinct but we have a violent side of ourselves we have a cruel side of ourselves we have a side of ourselves as men where we don't mind torturing people people I mean, there's men who don't mind being the lion the sadist the murderer there's definitely that inside of men this is why you see most serial killers tend to be men it's that type of that part of our nature is the the thing that we struggle with unconsciously but of course, women have their own savageness inside of them. The part of them that can set up a beautiful marriage, a beautiful love in the blue pill story of love with some poor little guy. And then she can go and get fucked by the neighbor and have him come inside of her and fill her womb up with loads of kids that he doesn't have to take any responsibility for because maybe he's a bigger dick or he's got a better jawline or he's more handsome. His eyes are more, they've got a better uh, Cathal tilt is that what it's called or better hunter eyes or whatever it is he's more handsome he's taller whatever it is she gets bred by him and then she goes back to the blue pilled romantic love story that she's living with this other guy and he gets the privilege of raising these kids that are not his own this is what you start to see is that once you have this red pill experience you start to see this savage nature you start to understand you start to understand why the nice guy always gets it finishes last and you start to wake up from what's going on now of course this savageness this brutality i think is actually quite an important stage as we would talk about here i think schopenhauer and the buddhists are obviously correct they're obviously right about many things but this is where we arrive at nietzsche and we find ourselves getting ready to go beyond this type of pessimism and negativity because nietzsche was an ardent student of schopenhauer nietzsche absolutely loved schopenhauer he didn't agree with him though and that's an interesting thing because what the way most people live is in this state of denial. They are caught up in the blue pill fantasies. They're romanticizing. It's so funny how German philosophy, the, all these German incels and these German chuds have the same sort of psychological patterns as these red pill manosphere guys 150 years later. Just like when you go and you meet the normal, the normal blue pilled guy who isn't aware of the savage nature of woman and the delusional nature of man. They're not aware of the savage nature of reality. They're out of touch. They're not red pilled. When you become red pilled, you're eventually going to become pessimistic because you're going to contact with the savage nature of the world and you're going to start to see this irredeemable 
ugly side. Jung would call this the, the discovery of the shadow, you know, and you'll confront the shadow and it'll start to di distort you a little bit and you'll get warped and bent out of shape. And this is sort of what Schopenhauer is like. He, he is pessimistic. He is honest. And the thing is, is that compared to the blue pill, the pessimist is always more persuasive because the pessimist is more correct. He's more true. The problem we have is that we lie to ourselves about reality because reality is so unbearable to live. We come up with blue pill delusions. We come up with, you know, fantasies. We come up with all sorts of fictions and nonsenses and we give all sorts of purposes to life that just don't, that simply don't exist. And the brutal, harsh reality is so difficult that we, we struggle to bear it because our emotions are so intense that it's very hard for us to push those out of the way and us to remain rational. We're, we're simply, we are emotional and there's no way we can overcome this. And so Nietzsche loved Schopenhauer because Schopenhauer was giving him that, you know, Schopenhauer was, I was going to say, take the condom off. That might be a pretty, bit of a strong metaphor here with the German incels. But Schopenhauer gives it to you hard. You know, he punches you right in the jaw and he shoves reality in your face and you get that clack and you're like, oh my God, this is what life is actually like. And you know it's true. Deep down, there's something true to it. There's something very, very deceptive about who we are. We're very unconscious of what we are. And we have this sort of impulsive, immoral, nasty nature that has its own ends and its own goals. And these goals are not individualistic at all. They're not concerned with our egos at all. And they see an awful lot of that stuff as very, very petty. And an awful lot of our fantasies about morality and about what is right and wrong and about how the way things should work are all just based on our own impulses and desires for how the world could serve us. We'd like true love to exist in the way that we think about it in our blue pill little heads. We'd like women to be floating fairy angels who don't take poops. We would like stuff like this because we're delusional little children that want to live in these fantasies. But the real world is not like that. The real world is savage, it is violent, it is brutal. And there's no way that we can escape from that. But you can digest that. And of course, it, it will make you pessimistic. But Nietzsche was trying to do this thing where you could sincerely confront that brutal reality, but not become pessimistic, not become jaded. Because what he sees with Schopenhauer and with Buddhism, and again, Buddhism is a very complicated religion, but generally speaking, we see this sort of confrontation with the black pill and then this desire to escape, this desire to say, I, I cannot participate in this anymore. This is too hard. This is too evil. This is too bad. I, I need to, I, I don't want to, to participate in the world. And you see this with uh, in the red pill space with things like MGTOWs or black pillars, you know? These are people saying the, the game of women are, 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 is pointless. And MGTOW is like, are men going to go the wrong way or something like this? And this is an escape from it. And I completely understand why they would say that. You know, it's like, do you want to deal with some savage harpy that's going to, you know, use the, the government to force you to pay her alimony while she has sex with another man in your house and breeds children with them while you're funding it? It's like, whoa, that's pretty, that, that black pill is going to keep you safe from some pretty extreme experiences that some poor little blue pilled guy who's like hearing all these stories maybe he's a christian maybe he's like sort of some liberal or something like that and he's sort of saying oh i've got to go and be the, the i've got to stand a man up and do do all these type of things he gets sucked into this venus flytrap of, of woman's desires to exploit him of the nature's desires to get the most out of him and the woman in order to achieve what she needs to achieve which is more gazelles for the meat grinder but nietzsche wanted to see could he confront these horrific realities, accept them and affirm them. Accept life's bleakness and affirm this. Accept this savageness inside woman and not get jaded with life and not get resentful towards life. Accept that we are delusional, that we have a horrible nature inside of ourselves. Accept that we're pawns of nature, but not become negative. Now, Nietzsche's approach towards this, he called himself pessimism of strength. And you can think of it this way. If you are strong enough, if you are powerful enough, you actually aren't too scared about this black pill truth of reality. Because I guess what this reality of life is telling you is that it's a bit of a savage game out there. And the strongest tends to do quite well. It's a little bit like might is right, you know? The strongest lion tends to succeed. Now that's very scary for you if you're the gazelle. That's very scary for you if you're in any way gonna be the victim or in any way gonna fail. If you're not strong enough to overcome reality and wrestle with life. But if you are strong enough, you can certainly see that pessimistic reality 
but you don't necessarily have this fear for it, have this revulsion for it. In some sense, you can actually launch yourself upon reality and with that strength, wrestle reality and succeed despite it and actually become the winner, to become the person who comes in on, on the, the strong sense outside of it. And this is sort of what Nietzsche meant by having that vitality and that strength to fight with life and actually affirm it then as a consequence. Now, I'm not sure Nietzsche, the simp, is the best life coach for how to get girls, but if you were to see about what he's describing here, imagine if you could understand woman's nature, but understand that you're strong enough. You are powerful enough, compelling enough, handsome enough. You are full of enough vitality that you're not afraid of woman's savage nature. In some sense, you're strong enough that you're able to lead it, perhaps even be favored by it. Favored by it in the way that Nietzsche says, careless, mocking, forceful. That's how wisdom wants us because she is a woman and saves her love only for the warrior. You are not intimidated by woman's savage nature. You are conscious of it. You are pessimistic of the way that the world works, the way that woman works, the way that woman as an avatar for life works. But you're not afraid of it and you're not jaded with it and you're not black and you're not negative towards it. You don't hate it. You definitely don't resent it because he was against all this stuff. Instead, you actually can affirm it because you're so overflowing with Dionysian power. You're so full of force that in some sense, you're the thing that life is looking for. You're the lion that wants to be rewarded. You're the strong soul that life wants to flatter and fill full of vitality. This is what you represent. You're beyond that old petty jadedness that occupies many other people. And in this Nietzsche captures a very fascinating energy. It's an attitude because the truth is, I guess you could say the truth, but the truth doesn't teach you how you relate to it, how you understand it. Just like the red pill doesn't teach you how you should emotionally feel about it. It just shows you a set of realities that are very, very hard to digest. And if you are weak, if you're a, a soft boy, if you're a, a man intimidated by the nature of woman, your attitude towards the realities are going to be very, very negative. You're going to be very pessimistic and black-pilled and jaded and resentful. And if you're too weak or maybe even just a little bit simpish or naive, your attitude is going to be to romanticize, to escape into fantasies. But if you are strong, if you are overflowing with sexiness and power and women are going to absolutely adore you, you're the, the vital force that they are drawn towards because you've built that inside of yourself. You've cultivated a monstrous and strong spirit. If you're sucking that amount of energy towards yourself and you're presented with reality, that doesn't necessarily mean you're going to take this jaded perspective upon reality. You're not going to turn around like Schopenhauer or the Buddhist and say, I want to escape from this. You might even say, I want to go towards that. I want to participate in that game. Let's have an absolute fun fair here. Let's go and see what this is all about because I feel the power. I don't feel intimidated. I feel the confidence to engage with the chaos. And what this comes down to is simply saying that if you have the power if you are a force of nature strong enough, full of Dionysian will enough, a w willing to crush your delusions and see reality for how it is, but have the strength inside of yourself to embrace reality, you might actually have a happy ending. You might be able to set up love. You might be able to set up relationships that create powerful children and see great families being built. Because of course, as much as the bad stories all exist, there's plenty of good stories. There's plenty of successful marriages. I've met plenty of girls and women, older women, who've had husbands that they are in love with to the very end of their lives. Because women are not evil fundamentally. Women are like us. We're all cocked by nature, trapped in samsara. And they have these big emotions inside of themselves. And they are attracted to strong men, just like men are attracted to beautiful women. And it seems like if you can be good enough, if you have that force inside of yourself, many things can go right. So perhaps Nietzsche, the German incel, the simp, the simp who got no girlfriends, the incel, the virgin who died of syphilis, perhaps he might have had an attitude, a red pill frame that you can take that can help you get more girls, which I guess is probably the point that we're talking about today. So... I'm going to leave it there. Thank you very much for your time. Stay juicy. Tell me what you think. Do you think Nietzsche was an irredeemable simp and Schopenhauer was 100% correct and this is just all cope? We're just rationalizing our rationalizing our way black, back into the blue pill, back into the matrix. Do you think Schopenhauer was just a bit too much of a jaded chud? He didn't know what's going on. Or do you think that this is all terrible misogyny from some German incels and you're very, very mad at this and we should go out and burn Nietzsche and Schopenhauer's books? If you do that, call me. I'd actually like to partake it'd be a relief it'd be this conquest over knowledge itself the return to the primal fire era where we start burning
burning stacks of books, running around in skins and conquering all the people who are too much of a, too, too black pill simps to engage with reality. I will talk to you later. Stay juicy. Bye bye.